Welcome. It is noon and we are here at the Athenaeum of Philadelphia for a virtual conversation with Howard Gillette. I am so delighted that all of you have joined us today. Um, the Athenaeum, if you have been able to uh, visit us in person in the last month, you um, are probably one of many who have just been so enjoying, oh, Toast is my cat, nice. <laughs> You've been so enjoying our newly renovated space. It um, is, is, uh, is, is a busy, lively place right now with people coming to study and work, come to programs, um, to check out books, uh, to just enjoy a cup of coffee or tea in our new member lounge. And so I invite all of you to come and join us at the Athenaeum. But today I'm so glad you're here with us in person, uh, or virtually, sorry, um, with our special guest, Howard Gillette. Many of you know Howard as a um, professor of, of modern US history, uh, looking at urban and regional development. You may also know him as the co-editor of the Encyclopedia of Greater Philadelphia. Um, Howard is a professor of history emeritus at Rutgers University Camden. He has also taught at George Washington University and the University of Pennsylvania and um, has received quite a few awards for his work, including um, honored in 2018 with the History Historical Society of Washington, D.C.'s Visionary Historian Award and Society for American City and Regional Planning History's Lawrence Greckens uh, Prize for Sustained Teaching Excellence and Educational Leadership in the Field of Planning History in 2019. We're very glad to have you here with us today, Howard. Howard is going to talk with us um, based on his most recent book from Penn Press, The Paradox of Urban Revitalization, Progress and Poverty in America's Post-Industrial Age, a uh, question and concern that uh, all of us in Philadelphia and uh, places like Camden and other, other major U.S. cities are, uh, are grappling with these days. So I invite you to join me in welcoming warmly Howard Gillette to the Athenaeum of Philadelphia. Okay, uh, I hope we're uh, on the screen properly. Can everybody see the, uh, can we see the slide? Okay, it doesn't look quite yes. right to me. Okay. Yes, it looks uh, good. Something is, well, anyway, I want to thank you all for being with us. And um, Beth in particular for inviting me to uh, join you. There is so much going on today that we kind of forget that one of the sustained questions of the last 40, 50 years, the period that I've been working in the European history field, uh, continues to plague us, this, the fate of our post-industrial cities. And yet um, we've seen recently that um, in the last oh, 15 or 20 years, something has changed. The cities that experienced the greatest devastation in the years after World War II, it began to come back. We've seen more investment, we've seen uh, higher property rates, we've seen uh, opportunities to do more with the city budgets uh, than we've uh, had before. And as a consequence, uh, we begin to think about the cities uh, coming back in a, uh, in a kind of major way. Um, the uh, Newspapers have been uh, using tropes of one kind or another to try to explain and uh, describe what's happening. And the typical uh, approach has been to uh, begin to describe places as the next Brooklyn, a place that's revitalizing uh, uh, as uh, through gender gentrification, uh, perhaps near a near uh, city. So we look at Oakland, we look at Newark as a possible next Brooklyn. We look at even Detroit, as a, a next Brooklyn. And uh, this is a, a kind of a general feeling that over the last 20 years, the cities have been coming back significantly. And if we look at a place like Washington, D.C., where I lived for almost 30 years, leaving it in 1999 at, the, at a point when the Congress was uh, controlling it because of its poor finances, uh, it would be hard to believe until I got home on the train after putting my condo for sale uh, and getting four offers on the trip 
uh, that things were changing and they changed very quickly. So the places like Shaw have become uh, gentrified areas, places like even uh, North uh, 8th Street Northeast uh, has become a, a classy destination to, uh, to uh, visit and uh, even rebranded re as the Atlas District where uh, the companion restaurant to Philly's Veg is located. So uh, it's not a um, insignificant phenomenon. It's happening uh, across the country in many uh, mid-sized cities, in addition to places like New York and Los Angeles. And it's coming with a, a lot of consequences, some of which have been anticipated for a number of years. When I was living in Washington, D.C., I took it a little bit skeptically, but uh, people, uh, black people in particular, were talked about the plan uh, and as captured so well in this Tony Tolls um, cartoon to, uh, from uh, a Buffalo paper some years ago. The plan presumably was that whites uh, would leave the city when it was not worth living in and, and wait around till the time it was, and then they'd come back. And of course, as they came back, they pushed people out. And that's exactly what's happened in good portions of Washington, D.C., and and uh, and other cities as well. So uh, revitalization uh, progress, as we call it, uh, has had some consequences. And that's why I used uh, as a subtitle, uh, one that I borrowed from uh, Henry George, writing at the height of the Gilded Age, uh, progress and poverty. The, the, every, as uh, the cities uh, got richer and, and uh, significant investment came into them, uh, poverty deepened in the 19th century. And indeed, it's happened again in the 21st century, as uh, the uh, author uh, um, Richard Florida uh, has written in his 2017 book, The Urban Crisis. And Florida made the point that uh, this was not just a crisis for the cities, but the crisis for the country, because we rely so significantly on cities to uh, drive our economies. Well, the traditional response, at least over the last 30 or 40 years, to um, uh, the, the challenges of post-industrial cities has been to try to find subsidies of one kind or another to bring business back into the cities, to, to reverse the outflow of monetary capital to the suburbs. And this has been described at some length by a number of scholars, but uh, Paul Peterson put it pretty clearly in City Limits that the emphasis would be on uh, private enterprise and not um, trying to re redistribute funds through socially motivated programs of the kinds associated with uh, the activist 1960s. Critics call this neoliberalism, uh, referring basically back to the laissez-faire capitalism of the late 19th century that Henry George wrote about. Well, there are um, nine cities in the study, and I, I took this on in part because I uh, had done two of these cities in terms of, of, of book link studies, and I wanted to update those cities, but also I wanted to broaden this spectrum to other cities that were undergoing uh, similar kinds of changes. And so I looked at cities that had high poverty rates and uh, where a significant number of the population was, uh, was uh, challenged uh, in terms of their uh, rent burdens and uh, had a heavy uh, minority population. And rank them loosely according to how well they were working away from the old paradigm of uh, subsidizing business at the expense of everybody else and trying to share the wealth of the new arising income of, of revitalization. First city I looked at was one that um, was important to me for a number of reasons. Uh, over time, I lived near Baltimore for many years, uh, visited many times, and also got very much involved writing about James Rouse and his effect, not just in Baltimore, but in other cities. And of course, Freddie Gray's death there uh, prompted uh, significant soul searching among many people about what we were doing wrong about cities. And it was particularly important because Freddie lived in the Sandtown, Winchester area, which Rouse had targeted uh, with his enterprise corporation founded uh, after his successful shopping center career to try to do a comprehensive redevelopment plan that would be totally inclusive, that would be fully involving the uh, local population and um, what they wanted and what they needed 
and bringing great resources to the process, working with the first black elected uh, mayor of, of Baltimore, Kurt Schmoke. Well, this was so important that places like Detroit picked up the idea, uh, the at least reported on it favorably, and they were looking at Baltimore as a place that they could uh, find a, a model for the future. Well, after Freddie's death, uh, there were a number of initiatives, most particularly uh, one by the, the city and the state to try to get more affordable housing uh, into the city and to try to accommodate that. Uh, it wasn't terribly successful. Five years later, uh, the Baltimore Sun called this a total bust. But at the same time, there were other efforts as well. Um, the, there was a suit uh, against HUD uh, challenging public housing as it was concentrated in the inner city and the way in which it uh, captured and kept poor people away from opportunity zones in the other parts of the city and the suburbs. Now, that suit was won. And, and a program of move to the, the to opportunity was put in place, a very rigorous program, but it proved totally inadequate. Not nearly enough people could uh, get their way through the lottery to get these opportunities. And again, we found another kind of hopefulness about how things could be done better, but um, falling short. So Baltimore is 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 still low on the on the. Uh, um, the hierarchy in terms of being successful moving towards equity, equity, but at the same time, uh, we see some some possible models there. Well, what about Detroit? Here's the poster child, if you will, for post-industrial America, a city that has been uh, equated basically with ruined porn, where uh, we can see the ruins before us uh, in areas very near the city itself, and which uh, places uh, people like uh, Charlie LaBeouf uh, his uh, national bestseller book about the city could talk about the inadequate services and inadequate uh, uh, support systems for the great general part of the population. Of course, in 2013, the city went into bankruptcy uh, very famously. Uh, and yet um, a, number of, a number of people, uh, including uh, Richard Florida, have pointed to uh, Detroit, particularly the downtown area, as an area that is coming back, that's impressive, and that uh, can be a model for the future. We look at the uh, once um, divided and and uh, unattractive uh, central part of the city, which has been converted into a, a campus Martinus Square, which is populated with uh, many white people, as you can see, uh, in the downtown area, right near the um, headquarters for Quicken Loans, where um, the CEO, Dan Gilbert, has been buying up buildings, rehabilitating them, and bringing middle class people to live in the downtown. So, yes, for, uh, downtown Detroit is thriving and it's beginning to extend to certain parts uh, nearby. Um, and at the same time, what I thought was ter terrifically important about Detroit was a new strategic planning document that was put out the same year of bankruptcy, 2013, which talked very seriously about turning the um, uh, abandoned properties, about 30 or 40% of the entire uh, city into assets. This would be over a 30 or 40 year period. And most importantly, the chief funder for this uh, particular report, which still is in effect in many ways, uh, the Tresky Foundation, formed an office with some millions of dollars behind it to put the uh, planning document into effect. So Detroit at least had a vision for its future that was inclusive, that extended to the neighborhoods and included some grants early on to turn a bad environmental condition into, um, into certain assets. But at the same time, if we recognize the first set of grants that went out in 2018, about $100,000 to a number of community groups, they were pretty minimal. They were self-help efforts to try to do things like rain gardens and uh, didn't have any real impact, uh, in, at least immediately. At the same time, as some of you may know, huge amounts of money went into uh, rehabilitation downtown. And here, uh, a building that's about to be finished this year, uh, the reconstructed uh, Hudson Department Store involves some $200 million worth of subsidies to Gilbert, uh, including uh, future taxes that may be levied on people who work there or live in the area. So you've got incredibly generous subsidies going 
at the same time to downtown businesses that uh, significant uh, needs are uh, still on being unmet in the suburbs. Uh, sorry, not in the suburbs, but in the outer areas of, uh, of Detroit itself. And the most significant part of uh, the story, I think, and that in terms of a lost opportunity, was when the Obama administration found funds from TARP and directed them towards uh, helping people stop uh, foreclosure. And yet those monies were then converted to tearing down buildings instead of uh, uh, keeping people in their homes, with the result that the homeownership in the Black community in Detroit dropped about 10% over the period of the recession. And so uh, really uh, Detroit falls short too in terms of meeting its obligations and opportunities. You have a uh, continued decay, decay downtown. These are pictures by uh, Camilo Vergara. Some of you will know his name clearly, uh, showing uh, what is really reflected on the cover of the book, which is not a Vergara photograph, but showing the contrast between the rich downtown and the uh, areas outside of it. Well, I'm gonna shift now to Camden, which is another uh, a, a story uh, uh, that we're going to try to learn from. Um, also a city that's been seen as coming back. Uh, the phrase Camden is on the rise has shown up on city bu on buses that take uh, people from Ed's and Meds to their uh, work and uh, employment areas. Um, and clearly a, a city that's under the control largely, or at least the direction of a um, powerful political figure, George Norcross, uh, the, uh, the power behind the Democratic Party of South Jersey, also the chairman of the board of uh, Cooper Hospital, sh shown here in 2012 in a um, Courier Post story, laying out a vision for Camden coming back which included things that were actually got done, the reorganization of the police department, the expansion of uh, charter schools with uh, greater graduation rates and other things that were pointing towards bringing Camden back into the mainstream. He was able to do this, not in the way that uh, had been tried before by a state takeover, but by working with the Republican governor, Chris Christie. And I think because of Christie's um, uh, trauma, you might say, at the uh, George Washington Bridge uh, during his uh, shortly before his, uh, his uh, campaign for president, we forget that Christie really was looking to Camden as a kind of model for um, what you could do in a bipartisan way to make cities come back. And that was uh, his intent when he spoke in 2015 about the future of the city. But the real force behind this revitalization effort was a reorganization of the state's subsidy programs to try to help bring business into the state. Every state has this, but no state really uh, was as generous as it was under Christie uh, in a program that was spurred in many ways by uh, George Norcross's brother, Don Norcross, who was then in the state Senate, uh, got uh, a reorganization of these state programs and in the process of it, $1.6 billion went into subsidizing business to come into Camden. Well, it started with the 76ers moving across the river from Philadelphia, then extended to uh, Holtec, which was not too far away, and, and, uh, and bringing a building, a new building into, uh, the, which is now uh, an area that was revamped. Uh, this whole Broadway was re redirected and, uh, the building was put up on uh, land uh, owned by the state, once by uh, once owned by New York Ship, closed down in the 1960s. And then, of course, Subaru moved from Cherry Hill to uh, Camden with a new uh, building uh, downtown as well. The capstone of this was a big project on the waterfront, uh, projected to be about a billion dollars uh, in total fees. We see uh, Christie and Norcross uh, congratulating each other as they showed the uh, uh, projected uh, plan for this area, the picture below. And uh, the real fact of what came out in the building that's on the waterfront that you've probably seen if you've gone across the speed line, uh, the one that uh, George Norcross moved his own firm into with an $8 million, um, $180 million uh, subsidy along with two other firms that he was closely associated with. 
So there was a huge amount of money brought into the city. There was just presumably a jobs program uh, to try to help well, one of the cities that has the highest, one of the highest unemployment rates in the country uh, get the uh, help. And to try to facilitate that, the chief um, community organization in Camden, Camden Churches Organized for People, canvassed their own membership, created a plan for how uh, they could get greater training and access to these jobs, and in turn took that plan to the mayor and to the city council chair, uh, asking for a community benefits agreement, something that had been pioneered in Los Angeles and tried in New York and with Atlantic Yards and other places. Uh, and uh, the mayor and the city council chair who subsequently became mayor said, we can do this ourselves. We need nothing formal. Uh, and in fact, very little was done early on to help train people, move them into these jobs until several years after the first money began to pour in when Camden Works was formed as an an online uh, portal for people trying to find jobs uh, in this new uh, employment environment uh, and done almost entirely voluntarily by the head of the Cooper uh, partnership who uh, subsequently has left for another position. Well, it turns out, and we shouldn't have been totally surprised by this, that the entire program was politically connected. Many of the, the um, companies coming in were connected one way or another with the Norcross family, uh, George Norcross or his other brother, who was a lawyer, who uh, served as, uh, uh, who, who several clients uh, got large subsidies. And this became the, a kind of a, a big um, scandal in many ways investigated by a special task force uh, that uh, Governor Phil Murphy put in place and, and exposed by ProPublica and the Inquirer, among other uh, newspaper outlets, as a kind of uh, residue of old bossism uh, at the expense of uh, the opportunities that might have happened for others in the city. So Camden, again, uh, we'll have to say has a long ways to go to find equity in these kinds of investments. There have been some measures of progress, but they haven't actually been reported well. And one really doesn't know how many people uh, were benefited in terms of jobs uh, that came out of it. If we look more positively, we might look to Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh uh, was uh, singled out by the Brookings uh, Foundation early in uh, the, the, the 20s as a city that really uh, might uh, not only reconvert from industry to new tech um, kinds of investments, particularly building around the universities there, but also it had a big challenge in terms of being inclusive. And in Pittsburgh, at least, we can see that some of the mistakes of the past have been at least addressed. Um, many of you have enough background to know that the big program of the 1950s and 60s to address urban decay was urban renewal. This often resulted in the um, total demolition of all older neighborhoods near the downtown, as we see in the left-hand slide, uh, part of the slide uh, in the lower hill area in Pittsburgh, uh, when a new arena was put in for the penguins ultimately, um, much of the hill was destroyed, many people were displaced, this happened in New Haven, it happened in other cities that I looked at, uh, certainly happened in DC. Um, and the more recent reiteration of that land area as the old uh, arena was torn down, a new one was put up and a new space was carved out for investment, a community partnership was formed between the city and the, and the, uh, and the ownership of the Penguins and uh, involving the, a number of uh, organizations associated with the Hill uh, with inclusive housing and other kinds of investments in the Hill area so that you could see the buildup of the downtown. And at the same time, some of the benefits of that would recruit to the nearby neighborhood that uh, presumably would be protected uh, in the future uh, as uh, development was confined to the, the area that the Penguins owned. Another example is the area where the last steel site was turned uh, uh, operated, Hazleton, uh, a, a lower middle class neighborhood that had lost much of its investment over the years. Here we see a partnership between foundations, five of them, and headed by the Heinz Foundation, um, 
providing a kind of mix of housing, both uh, uh, market rate and subsidized, along with space for new technology investments, so that you have a kind of blending between the old and the new um, with opportunities built into the plan. Also, Pittsburgh has commissioned and put in place uh, a framework for evaluating how equitable investment has been and how well people are doing in various uh, sectors of their lives, including education, housing, and the like. Uh, these equity in indicators are uh, uh, put out every year. They put them out several years now, and they show Pittsburgh aspiring to higher uh, levels of education quality, of uh, access to uh, a, a, a medical care and the like, but also falling short. So. Pittsburgh at least knows where they want to go. Um, they've got a pretty progressive uh, administration following uh, the first with the first black mayor, but it was the, first, the previous white mayor, Bill Peduto, who put much of this in place. Newark, I think, however, was the city that I found most impressive, and it wasn't um, uh, intuitive. It wasn't even something that I expected to happen. The story there, many of you know, is, is one of uh, a transition from industrial concentration to a much uh, more impoverished uh, economy uh, as we move from a white ethnic dominated city to a series of black mayors, each of which, uh, starting with Ken Gibson, attempted to try to share the wealth that, as much as there was uh, of the various programs and investments that might be made in the city. And um, we found that each one of these mayors ended up criticizing their predecessor for not doing enough for the neighborhood. So that Sharp James, who was in place for six, six terms, uh, criticized uh, Gibson and then Cory Booker uh, criticized and finally in a second election effort uh, beat Booker uh, with the idea that we really needed to uh, be more equitable in our approaching of uh, uh, the fate of the city. At the same time, each of these mayors supported as almost every mayor in the country always has investment downtown. So we had uh, during uh, um, James's uh, tenure and, and into the next tenure, uh, a new uh, uh, hockey arena right near the train station. Uh, we have the NJ Pack, which is as an art center, a tremendously successful downtown investment in, in downtown uh, Newark. And also uh, uh, Panasonic uh, coming in from nearby uh, uh, area to uh, to locate in Newark's downtown. Uh, this, these uh, more recent uh, relocations have involved subsidies from the same funds that went into Camden. But as you can see from this chart, the amount of money that went to Newark was much smaller and the amount per job created is far less uh, uh, expensive. So that Newark has been more successful in, in at least uh, making use of those uh, those funds for the purposes that presumably they were um, uh, directed to. The person who is most uh, associated with the most recent uh, efforts in Newark is Roz Baraka, the son of the famous playwright and activist who himself started as a public school educator uh, they was elected to city council while Booker was still mayor, became uh, a kind of thorn in Booker's side. And ultimately, when he was elected, was uh, describing himself as a, offering a radical alternative to Booker's friend, business friendly approach to uh, Newark's issues. However, Newark, uh, uh, Baraka very quickly uh, recognized that he ought to take advantage of this um, period of time when investment was friendly and, and anxious for uh, uh, customers to, to take advantage of uh, living downtown and, and utilizing the buildings there. And so he became an active uh, supporter of bringing business back into the city and doing so even with subsidies uh, if necessary. Uh, so that during his tenure, uh, there was, um, excuse me, uh, During his tenure, there have been significant building projects in Newark as well. And um, uh, at the same time, he has been a master at trying to work together with both the business and, the, and educational communities 
to uh, utilize their resources to advance an agenda of equity in the city. So his um, buy, um, buy, live, and work in, an initiative has involved uh, subsidies to get people into uh, decent housing downtown. It's uh, encouraged the universities to procure goods from local businesses, and it's also uh, had a, a pipeline to jobs in a way that uh, was never uh, accomplished in uh, the city of, of, uh, of uh, Camden. Now, um, at the end of the book, I went back and looked at how these cities had done in the period I was doing the last part of the writing, the last three or four years, the Trump years, basically. And I was really pretty stunned to find that every one of these cities had seen increases in their um, median incomes and the median price for their homes. Uh, at the same time, poverty also increased. So the progress and poverty was actually fully uh, realized in this period. And what was most stunning was that the most successful cities, Pittsburgh included, had the highest levels of increased poverty. So poverty in, in Pittsburgh in the four years I was looking at it went up 23%. It went up about 15% in New Haven. It went up in every one of these cities except uh, Camden where it was so high already, it couldn't go up any higher. So uh, clearly we had a long ways to go uh, to, um, to uh, bring the equitable distribution of these new resources to the people that were there. And I looked for the ways in which that might be quantified in some way, or at least uh, qualified uh, in ways they did. So the chart I'm showing you here shows that every one of these cities had uh, subsidies to different businesses at the same time. Uh, they also had um, uh, some community benefits in terms of um, either a formal agreement of one kind or another, or inclusionary housing efforts, which would require um, new building projects to uh, have subsidized housing along with market rate housing. And um, at the same time, uh, most of them, and again, Camden is an exception, had some kind of institutionalization uh, for equity in their own communities. And New York, it was a commission that was formed in 2018 to, to measure uh, equity in the city. Uh, in other places like Oakland, there was a whole department of government that had to measure everything. And in, in Baltimore, there was an effort to try to measure through the planning department every investment as to how equitable uh, they were. Now, I don't write about Philadelphia in my book, but uh, we're in the greater Philadelphia area. And I know um, many of you are living in Philadelphia, and I think you could apply the same principles uh, that are applied in this book and the sense that um, Philadelphia, like all these other cities, is uh, revitalizing in many ways. It's doing so in ways that are gentrifying neighborhoods that are uh, closer to downtown. And this is happening in large degree because of uh, uh, tax, tax policies, which exempt or at least to reduce the uh, uh, um, amount of money that people have to pay on taxes for particularly in downtown areas. So it's not surprising that uh, areas near the downtown have been gentrifying and changing. At, at the same time, it's pretty clear that there are a number of different um, uh, elements of the city government who, which are trying to uh, deal with equity in one way or another and uh, addressing them in one way or another, though I think it's not as concentrated or institutionalized as it is in most of the other cities that I looked at in this book. Um, most interesting to me was the proclamation by two members of the uh, um, faculty at Drexel that um, the Amazon plan for uh, for Philadelphia was one that uh, would kind of provide a roadmap for the future of the city and would lay out a possibility. And, and you know, looking back at that plan, there's very little uh, discussion of equity. There's very little uh, uh, this decision making uh, pointed to that would uh, make it possible to take that uh, booster plan and put it into effect that would have an equitable effect. At the same time, there is a um, coalition for racial equity that meets uh, quite frequently. 
Uh, it's a volunteer group, but I think that there is a chance that they are going to have an impact over time. And certainly the, the faculty at Drexel are, um, are uh, working on different uh, projects, particularly along 52nd Street, which suffered uh, recently from, uh, from uh, civil disorders and has had a long uh, history of trying to come back from disinvestment uh, with a kind of uh, comprehensive plan using some of the uh, recovery funds and some of the future funds to bring that part of the city back. Finally, I would suggest that um, the Chinatown project, uh, the, the one the 76ers proposed arena provides a big test for whether or not you can have new investment in a place like that and still protect a nearby Chinatown neighborhood. To summarize, finally, I, I come back to two different kinds of approaches. Um, many of my academic colleagues would like to see the right of the city uh, institutionalized in, in, in across the urban spectrum. In fact, the Urban History Association is making the right to the city the focus of its uh, conference in Pittsburgh in the coming year. Um, this is a pretty radical view in many ways that you really construct the city to benefit the people who have been most uh, affected by disinvestment over time. And, and as uh, uh, David Harvey's statement here suggests, that means a re really moving towards a more social democratic approach. Uh, the um, more practical approach, I think, is suggested by Susan Feinstein and her book in the, uh, recently put out, uh, what she calls non-reformist reforms. And they would be, we would call incremental, but they are the kinds of reforms that if uh, taken, uh, have significant effect over time, that they would have a cascading effect of uh, building up other things. So you have affordable housing or you have a uh, inclusionary housing or you have a um, uh, community benefits agreement that then is built upon for extending it to a larger part of the city. Um, I would say that uh, we're at a kind of inflection point. Uh, this book was written largely before the pandemic. Um, the pandemic has put everything in disarray, and, but I would argue that there are at least a number of landmark uh, actions in these various cities that give us a roadmark, a roadmap for what could happen in the future. And because this book come out, came out uh, earlier this year and because it took a while to get published, I've been trying to update uh, what's happening in some of these cities on my blog and my website, so I'm giving you that location now. And as many of you may know, there's a uh, uh, a code that you can use if you would like to purchase this book at 40% off and free shipping from the University of Pennsylvania Press, which I certainly encourage you to take advantage of if, uh, if you can. So thank you for uh, including me and I'm anxious to hear what people have to say in terms of questions and concerns. Thank you. And um, there was a question about that. The article that I pointed out was in the Philadelphia Inquirer, and I thought I'd copied and pasted a link to it. And it was actually to um, some pickle bandages that <laughs> one of our children wants. So I'll get that right one. Thank you, Howard. Um, this is really fascinating. I think you brought up a lot of issues and questions. If anyone has questions, I encourage you to put them either in the chat or the Q&A. Um, but first, Carol Ann is wondering um, if it would be more helpful to focus on small businesses instead of large uh, support for small businesses, neighborhood businesses instead of large firms. Well, I, I think that uh, there's proof of it in many different ways um, that we see this in ethnic communities across the country. Um, really in the ways that other small communities have uh, emerged within larger cities, uh, you get a, a, a whole street of uh, uh, community businesses that are feeding upon one another and they're attracting uh, an audience of fellow ethnics of one kind or another. It's, it's true in Camden, it's true in, in all sorts of different other cities. So um, I think that part of the investment strategy for 52nd Street, which has a variety of different kinds of outlets, commercial outlets, is mixed, that you might have some larger uh, companies on the, on the street, but largely they're, um, they're localized, they're not that large. And if they 
create a synergy where they draw a lot of people to the area to shop, they will help each other. And I, I think that's a good um, investment for the money that goes into it. Certainly when you talk about a $260 million investment in Holtec, it's a little hard to say how that has um, uh, immediate um, re uh, multiplier effect because it's an isolated company that has no immediate uh, connection with the neighborhood nearby. And therefore it, it just doesn't, it doesn't revitalize the city. It just allows for a kind of a isolated uh, economic uh, magnet to, to cr be created, but not creating anything around it. Thank you. So Lisa um, Primavera says that she did her senior thesis 40 years ago on, on deteriorating housing and lack of affordability in Philadelphia. So she, she argued, and this is naively, for aggressive LNI pursuit of code violations and subsequent seizure of properties and sale or donation to people who had owned them or land trusts. Um, she goes on that revital, revital, revitalization without gentrification requires sustained and focused public effort and respect for community needs and desires. Infrastructure, safety, and support for the skills required for home ownership are essential. Support for neighborhood small businesses is also a requirement. So if you wanna comment on any of that. I agree. <laughs> I mean, I think the, 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 point, the point here, and I can only give some isolated examples here, is the community organizations are incredibly important. For a long time, we've relied on community development corporations, which have done a lot of this kind of work. Uh, and they have, in places like Camden particularly, begun to wither. And I think it has to do with whether or not uh, they can still maintain the bridges to the outside uh, investment, investment possibilities, to banks and to other uh, sources of, of revenue that can allow them to uh, direct their resources to their community as they see needed. Uh, but that's where I think we need to, uh, in whatever kind of projects we have, I think you need to have people on the ground who recognize that uh, there are multiple needs in any one community, including employment, uh, but also residential and recreational, and those ought to be coordinated. And that was the tragedy, I think, of Sandtown Winchester. I could not believe 20 years or 30 years after the fact, that Sandtown Winchester was as in bad shape as it was when all the statistics came out at Freddie Gray's death. It was a, a, a neighborhood that had constrained his opportunities rather than expanded them. And that was not what I expected. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, Nancy Moses uh, wonders if you could uh, say a little more about what you mean when you say that the pandemic put everything in disarray. She wonders, um, what you're beginning to see regarding potential impacts on the economics and equity goals of cities. Well, first I will say uh, hi to Nancy, a former student of mine from GW uh, many years ago. Um, and um, uh, the pandemic, I think, had a huge effect on the fact that people could not uh, congregate in uh, the ways they need to to have uh, impact on their own communities. What we were Bennett, what we were able to do was to have some kind of bridge funding so that um, people weren't evicted from their homes uh, as they have been since uh, that money has run out uh, and giving us a little bit of breathing space, you might say under uh, terrifically uh, difficult uh, conditions. What I'm seeing and, I, and where I wanna uh, point you to is that, um, that uh, the NOAC Center at uh, Drexel is uh, highlighting uh, ways of using these kinds of monies. Uh, so there's still uh, recovery money available in comprehensive ways that have the biggest impact. And I think uh, that um, uh, that Bruce Katz there has been writing about this. He's been writing about 52nd Street, but also he's been talking about uh, cities across the country using these funds in ways that are intelligent and not just filling the gaps. Uh, that they're moving um, communities forward in a kind of uh, integrated way rather than just um, going to one favorite group or another. So uh, I think that we, if we're thoughtful about it and we learn from one another that um, this, this interim, and it is an interim, 
uh, where we don't know investment will continue to come from the private sector, uh, where we can think intelligently about using public and possibly foundation and public money to, uh, to uh, move our communities forward in ways that are, are uh, sustainable. Uh, because I think Sandtown Winchester, again, was not sustainable, partly because <laughs> the federal government programs moved on to other, uh, other kinds of programs and enterprise zones in the right, and other neighborhoods got those enterprise zone monies, and, and uh, Sandtown Winchester was left behind. Um, so before I go on to some of these other questions, it's been noted that the code on the screen for the discount for your book uh, at Penn Press is a little bit obscured. Well, um, that's an interesting point. <laughs> I don't know quite how to deal with that. Um, well, how about we, for anybody on this program, we will get to you when Tess sends out the, um, the link to the program. We will also send out the discount code for the book. I'm going to take that off the screen because I think that uh, it's not helpful to have the, but yes, please do let them know. Um, I can also probably read it off at some point. I don't have it in front of me, but I will say that Penn Press is having a sale so that um if you go to them, you can probably get any book you want at the same price. So this was supposed to be a special code, but I have gotten a notice recently that they have a 40% off sale. And if you are a member of the Athenaeum, we do uh, we do have uh, a code available for you for, for discounts at any time on Penn Press Books. So um, you can let us know with that, but we'll make sure we get it to you. So Cattell wants to know if anyone has developed a good measure of equity. Yes, uh, I would go to the website for Pittsburgh and look at the way they organize it. Um, their uh, equity equity measures were developed by uh, uh, the New York New York uh, City University of New York, and uh, similar equity indicators were applied in in uh, Oakland as well. It's a terrific tool because it's not confined to any one sector of uh, the, the economy. It involves all sorts of parts of people's lives. And you could find that Pittsburgh's doing pretty well in, in a number of different sectors, but they're still falling short in education. We could see that possibly in Philadelphia as well uh, and in housing. So these are really important elements where they know they have to do better. They know they have to do more with an inclusive housing uh, measures, uh, which they have now a tax to uh, tax new investment uh, that would go into uh, subsidizing uh, affordable housing in neighborhoods that are changing. So uh, they know where their targets are and they have some programs that are addressed to try to do that. Thank you. So Tess put up both the, the hyperlink to go directly to to uh, Howard's book at Penn Press and um, the correct code. So that's right up there for everybody. Um, and now Sandy um, says, we were also help hopeful years ago for Progress Plaza as a model for doing the right thing. She wonders what went wrong, the pattern seems to keep repeating. Yeah, I don't know a lot about Progress, uh, that uh, plaza, uh, so I, I can't uh, say directly, but I, I do think that um, sustaining minority business and enterprise has been an up and down process in part because of the change of uh, federal policy over time. Uh, you may be shocked to remember back that Richard Nixon running in the primary against Nelson Rockefeller uh, talked about minority enterprise and he was a big fan of, of, of Philadelphia's uh, uh, programs for uh, training training uh, minority enterprise minority business, and and so you know it goes back at least fifty years uh, these kinds of programs, but they're up and down. We don't we have a whole uh, section of the federal government for minority enterprise, but it doesn't it it does it it has more or less support depending on. Uh, who is in charge, and also you have community groups that come and go. So uh, though I can't be specific about that project, I think that there are projects like that are always at risk. 
So Stan Mullen, uh, I, I think WFH, you mean work from home. And if that is not what you mean, Stephen, please <laughs> put the correct what you mean. But uh, he says he, he, he thinks that, that work from home is this decade, decade's redlining in terms of its uh, negative effect on minority and lower income populations. I wonder if you would agree with that. <laughs> well, it's an interesting use of the term. Um, sure, I think the people who are working from home are more privileged. Um, they started that way um, because they had the option. Um, many of the frontline workers during the pandemic were minorities um, in hospitals and other kinds of facilities that couldn't work from home and, and uh, people had to be there. So uh, whether I'd use redlining or not, redlining is a, is a, you know, a purposeful uh, discriminatory tool which has been applied um, in ways that uh, have uh, created a, and sustained a very great wealth gap, which I do talk about some in the, in the book, uh, which we are um, obliged, I think, to try to overcome. And that's why when, when money is available, when revitalization takes place, when, when capital flows begin to return to places where they're needed, we really have to think about the opposite of redlining uh, but directing these funds to people who need them in ways that can have multiplier effects. No, I think as you're saying that that a, another effect of work from home is not just that those uh, it's usually higher higher income level jobs that have the freedom to work from home. But um, I think say you know downtown Philadelphia, the people who do rely on the jobs working in those stores are most likely to be negative, negatively affected when the businesses they expect to come back, you know, the workers they expect to come back and shop at those stores are not coming back. And I will add that there's been some recent commentary that this working at home is the death knell of the cities. Uh, I don't think that's true. I think that cities have always thrived because of face-to-face -face interaction. They've been successful economically because of face-to-face -face action. I think we're gonna see a, a reversal of this ten trend uh, but I don't think it will ever go away. I think there will be plenty of people working from home one way or another uh, for some time. So Jack asked a question I, I find very interesting too. I, you know, as you were talking about the, the Camden, Camden churches organized for people. So Jack wonders how important a part in the renewal of these cities have religious organizations been and can you cite an example or two? Often, I think they've been tremendously uh, important, and, and Camden is a particularly good example of this. I, I, uh, in many cities in the minority community, you have uh, big churches and small churches, um, those that uh, are basically cathedrals and those are storefronts. And how do you get the people who participate in those churches together? You have to have some kind of organizational structure, and what people uh, learned uh, by having an organizational structure across these different denominations and, and locations and, and, and uh, uh, structures was that if you could coordinate your, your focus, you could come to uh, the politicians and, and uh, focus on one or two issues, uh, put them before them and put them on the spot and represent people across geography uh, in ways that have effects. So, of course, we talk about community development corporations. We're talking about very localized work, but we talk about coalitions across space. We need to have some organizing tools, and and religion is one of the more effective ones. We see this in many different cities where uh, religiously uh, oriented or or connected people are taking leadership roles. Right. So we have three last questions up here. So I'm I'm, I'm going to take these three questions. I think they'll take us to the end of our hour. Um, first, Charlie, I know you asked this question earlier, so we'll get we'll, we'll go to you right now. Um, uh, Charlie Kruger is wondering if the $260 million whole tech tech center is up and running in Camden and wondering if that was Norcross related. If it was what? Related to Norcross. Oh, yes. Um, Phil Norcross had whole tech as his client. Um, the company the company got $260 million, although they were slated for less because they needed $260 million to build that building. So it, 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 when this all came out, finally, it was revealed as a um, 
capital investment program, not a jobs program, at least as it was being operated in Camden. Thank you. So um, Steve Barron is wondering how much of Newark versus Camden's outcomes could be the result of Newark's proximity to New York with a much larger job and housing market than Philly. I would say none. <laughs> I, I mean, Newark, Newark and Camden are in similar situations. They're overshadowed by the big city across the river, and they feel, uh, in some ways, defiant uh, and to be a part of it. So, uh, the only thing I can say is that in advertising for some of the new buildings, the one in the Ironbound uh, area, uh, the the attraction of millennials. Uh, as far as the eye could see across the river, as well as within Newark, uh, was one of the uh, marketing products. So maybe uh, I underestimate that there aren't uh, people flowing from Philadelphia into Camden to live, but there are people moving from New York to, to, to Newark to live, and that's a significant difference. Interesting, interesting. And then, then Lisa Wester wonders if you could comment on the long overdue movement um, to remove urban highways that had physically destroyed and cut off neighborhoods. I think this is an incredible um, change. And I think Joe Biden uh, should take a bow for this because city after city, and it includes um, almost any city we can think about, had highways that ran through um, uh, black neighborhoods, Detroit, New Haven, DC. They were all intended in essence to um, uh, uproot these people was a nice urban renewal technique. There was federal money for it. You could move people out and, um, and you could make it possible for the white suburbanites to come shop downtown again and to rectify and to uh, uh, provide in essence reparations for that. Uh, reversing that is very, very important. But I will say one thing, and I encourage uh, her to look at the Milwaukee chapter. Uh, John Norquist, Norquist uh, did remove a highway spur from um, Milwaukee, uh, and um, that area was redeveloped, but it was largely redeveloped in a way that only indirectly supported um, people of need. Uh, the community couldn't be rebuilt. Um, the housing was fairly high income, and um, the only thing that the community got out of this, the lower income community, was uh, some subsidiary uh, community benefits for subsidizing housing in other parts of the city. So we haven't shown uh, yet a, a truly equitable reconstruction uh, or uh, reparation, if you will, of that particular wrong over time, but it is terribly important. And I think it's going to be a very exciting part of, of that, uh, that bill that uh, Biden got through with Congress. <laughs> Thank you. That is that's this is wonderful. Um, this has just been such a, an interesting and fascinating talk. Tess has has uh, filmed it, so if any of you um, want to be able to look at it again or share with anybody, uh, we'll be getting that to you soon. Um, she'll also include in that the link to the discount for Howard's book, which is also up on the chat screen. Um, we hope you'll join us this Friday evening. Tomorrow evening at six o'clock, we have uh, another Allegro Presents Chamber concert with Jordan Dodson, who is an amazing classical guitarist with Brendan, uh, Brandon Patrick George on flute. I hope you will come um, for a wonderful evening of classical music. We also still have tickets available for our in-person program next week on December 13th with uh, historian Richard Cohen, Making History, the story Storytellers Who Shaped the Past. Um, as we kind of wind down this year, 2022, and get ready for another season of wonderful programs in 2023. So we do hope you will join us. Howard, we hope you will join us for some programs as well. We thank you so much for sharing your noon hour with us with this very informative and helpful conversation. Hope you all will go out and buy the book. Um, give it to those who should read it, buy a copy for yourself, and um, we we'll look forward to seeing all of you again soon, both online and in person. Thank you, and have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>